Well, let's get started. It's just there's too many wonderful things <laughs> um, not to start a minute or two early. Um, I am so thrilled to welcome back Jane Carlin, who is one of our favorite people and favorite speakers. Jane, of course, is the um, heart and soul of the Collins Memorial Library um, at the University of Puget Sound, and also the um, um, the mentor, the guide, the um, cheerleader, the fill-in-the-blank for book artists uh, around the country. Despite the fact that she uses words that I really never want to hear oh. <laughs> in here, which are, oh, it's out of print. <laughs> she, show, she will show us the most amazing books. Thank Here's you, Jane. Cynthia. Well, thank you all so much. and. Um, I'm very honored to be invited back. Thank you all for having me. And I think I know most of you in the room, but and perhaps all of you know one another, but could we just do a quick introduction around the table and say a little bit about if you're a book artist or aspiring to be an artist or Jan? <laughs> I'm Jan Dove and I make artist books and I'm also curating a show that's a collaboration between the collection here and artists in the area, and it's going to be at the Port Angeles Art Center. And uh, if you um, want <coughs> invites to it, please let me know, and I'll get it to you right away. Mm -hmm. uh, just give me your email, and I'll send it out. Okay. I'm Pamela Hastings. I'm also from Port Angeles, and I make fiber art, fabric art books, and soft sculpture, and I make books and publish. Uh, I'm J.D. and Wu. I'm sort of I'm very new to the Book Arts uh, Forum. I've been volunteering with Amy to Great. learn more about this room, and I love it. And I think all the artists are fabulous, so I just want to learn more. They yeah. are fabulous. <laughs> hey, I'm Robin Simon, and sort of similar. I'm also very new to this, and um, have been <coughs> loving getting closer to the books and learning more about them. Great. I'm Linda Yelker. I'm an imposter. I'm textile driven, but I love coming to these Saturdays. <laughs> no imposters. I'm Peggy Graving, and I'm just a lover of books and a lover of art, and when you put the two together, it's amazing. That sounds like a really great bumper sticker. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Catherine Blake. Uh, I'm an architectural historian, and I work as an archivist. But in another life, I was a printmaker, and I have always loved book arts. That's great. In my former life, I was an architecture and design librarian. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> in Cincinnati. <laughs> Carolyn Terry, I'm a book artist. Oh, Sue Lynn Long. Uh, this has always been my favorite room. It's, I'm just fascinated by the creativity in there. And I've dabbled in all different kinds of art. That's great. And yeah, Peggy Smith Venturi, and I make uh, artist books. A few are in the show here. I'm Susan Kellen, and I am a longtime book creator, book artist, and I get my greatest joy from sharing it all and teaching. So it's good fun. Great. Everybody knows Amy. So. <laughs> um, when you said imposter, sometimes I feel a bit like an imposter when I'm in a room of all of you creative artists. And two weeks ago, I went to the studio of a member of the Puget Sound Book Artists, a woman by the name of Elizabeth Walsh. And she lives set in south of Tacoma, near Olympia. And she had this wonderful folded book uh, project on her table. And I said, that's amazing. And she said, you can make one, Jane. And I did. I should have brought it. I was like, yes, I've actually made it. So um, it's really, really wonderful to be here and also to be in this room with all these incredible books. I think they all demonstrate how books can really help us confront difficult issues head on. And I really appreciate um, the Bainbridge Island Museum of Art putting on this show that really con confronts social issues. 
And if some of you attended my presentation just about a year ago, um, I talked to you about the work that we're doing at the University of Puget Sound associated with artist books. And I wanted to continue on that theme to give you some insights about how we're developing our program. And I'm sharing with you books from our collection that we've purchased over the year, as well as books that students have created in classes first-time bookmakers, but as we have attempted to weave artist books into the curriculum, more and more of our professors are seeing the light, so to speak, of how the artist book can effectively demonstrate and showcase the research and the personal narratives of students in a different format other than just the written paper or the term paper. So I thought you'd enjoy seeing some of the books made by students. And to put in context, uh, we have a special collections I think some of you have visited, but we've been purchasing artist books proactively for the last eight years. And I really try to look at books that can fit into the curriculum or relate to issues associated with our current um, social climate. So as a university, we're looking at books that might uh, reference social justice issues such as many of the materials we'll first be looking at dealing with good morning migration and immigration we also look at environmentalism we look at books that are telling the story from personal perspectives and of course we're interested in books that demonstrate aspects of our community here in the northwest and i have been working with a variety of faculty not just in art but in political science, in education, and in some of the uh, sciences to demonstrate how the artist book can be a collaborative experience. So first, as a disclaimer, I'm going to admit that many of the books that I'll be showing you today have a certain political point of view and bias that you may or may not agree with. But one of the nice things about artist books is that it we can share all of our all different sides of the coin, so to speak. And I uh, wanted to, to really focus in the beginning of our talk on an issue that's very important on our campus at the University of Puget Sound. Um, we have undocumented students that attend our university, as all universities do across the nation. And our students are very anxious about the current environment. And so over the course of the last year at the University of Puget Sound, just like at University of Washington and on campuses across the nation, there's been a lot of student protests and unrest and also demonstrations. And many of our students are very concerned with immigration and migration. So I've been actively seeking artist books that can help tell that story in dialogue. We have a program at the University of Puget Sound it's Tag the Yellow House, and that's a program and place where students can go to talk about issues of personal concern. And we've been using the books that are books and portfolio pieces that are on the table um, to talk with students about undocumented status, to talk to students about immigration and migration. So in front of each one of you is a broadside from a series called Migration Now. And I'm just going to, going to show you how I received, uh, because I think one of the nice things about this particular um, series, this is done by an organization called Just Seeds. And while Migration Now is out of print, Cynthia, there are many other <laughs> wonderful portfolios. So this is an organization that started as a collaborative of printmakers. It started in Portland in the late 80s, and now it's since landed in uh, Pittsburgh, where artists are paired with social justice organizations and or other types of businesses to create uh, portfolios associated with a particular theme. And this theme is Migration Now. And each of the individual prints represents a theme or concept associated with migration. And when I first saw these, and many of you might have attended a talk given by Marshall Weber, did some of you? Um, Marshall brought this to my attention. I had no idea that this cooperative even existed. 
what's great about it is that they come packaged and also in presentation format so that they're very easy to display. Um, lots of information and posters that you can put together. So as an educational piece, they're wonderful. Um, as I was saying to Cynthia, even though this is out of print, the Just Seeds organization does provide circulating copies of their portfolios for museums and educational display. So for those of you that might be managing a gallery or you want to have a display, you could contact Just Seeds and you can just Google them, so to speak. Um, I just want to read you a little section of what the, the emphasis is. Um, migration is a phenomenon, not a problem, something that simply is. The right to migrate and to move freely is our human right. When societies restrict or choke off the movements of their citizens, they end up doing the work of a dam. They generate power and control floods, but in doing so, they destroy life and wreck the surrounding space. The artists in this um, effort want to reimagine migration as a social practice that is not to be prevented, but, but to be related to. All migration starts with social relationships. When people move, they are going either towards their families or communities or more often away from them. They move to help their relatives or support them by leaving. People migrate because their homes stifle them, because their homes become burdens and they need to shed in order to have full lives. They move in search of opportunity or to escape their past or simply to survive. They move because of lies they are told and that they have come to believe, and they move to fulfill the most beautiful and fragile of their dreams. Migration is fundamentally about our right to move freely across planet Earth and in search of our fullest and best selves. So all of these pieces here emulate and represent that theme. And I'm just thinking, would maybe each one of you kind of just say what is in front of you and hold it up so everybody can see it. it. This appears to be two miners sitting at the edge of a cave, but it could be farmers or anyone, I guess, um, having their meal, woodcut. And there's no title or artist name. And that's a good point that I will make just for the Just Seeds website also provides you with a visual documentation of every single image with the artist information and who created it. So it's a wonderful educational piece. Yeah. And I'll back up. It look, actually is a uh, husband and wife. Like. So Maybe perhaps is that image is, right, is telling us that's a temporary home, yeah. that they're fleeing, that Perhaps they don't really have a place to sit at the table. So very impactful. Anybody else care to share what's in front of them? Um, this one is a missile um, mm -hmm. uh, superimposed or connected with a corn cob, and it's hovering over what appears to be, it's a silhouette of a um, family man, woman, and a child holding hands and they appear to be fleeing and the missile is hanging over their heads and the text says solidarity with migrant workers not agribusiness. Mm -hmm. And there is a name on the back, Ann Lampert. That, uh, this picture down here is on big signs in the San Diego, down at San Diego as you approach the border. Oh, oh both ways. Yeah. How about and that? And How interesting. There's more text at the bottom. Yeah. It says, since the passing of NAFTA in 1993, U.S. subsidized corn has flooded Mexico, resulting in the unemployment of 20% of Mexico's small-scale corn producers, many of whom head north in search of work. Uh, just, yeah, a little bit more information about Just Seeds, and that's really interesting that you said that it's on a billboard because they um, indicated that they operate this very um, robust online site. So again, just Google Just Seeds and a distribution center. 
and they also do a lot of blogging. So if any of you are users of um, applications that you can get RSS feeds, I highly recommend having their blog uh, on your list. And they produce portfolios of art prints on different topics uh, across the board. So each one could be an individual educational class, so to speak. There's a woman with her fist clenched by what looks like the border wall, or the parts that have been built, maybe. And it says, with or without papers, we will always be illegal. We are illegal because we don't obey their laws, their laws of misery, exploitation, hate, and separatism. Their laws that make sure we are always poor, their laws that kill us slowly. We jump their borders and defy death because we didn't make borders in our lives. We fight, we resist, we dare. So a way we might use these in class is if we're having a discussion on the border wall. What does that mean? Um, having a dialogue on is it something that we should support or shouldn't support? Where do you stand personally? What are the points of views on either side? But these are very impactful statements. And I, I should know this. By heart, I think there are 28 artists, so I have a whole stack of the um, portfolio prints. So as we conclude our talk, we can also you can browse through these. Anybody else want to share uh, one that's? Well, we're going to talk about the border wall. This is about the border wall. It's a jaguar, and he's jumping over the wall. The um, sorry. The subject is, the Jaguar Macho B, a resident of the U.S.-Mexico borderlands, crossed indigenous lands, walked among various cultures, roamed ecologically rich habitats as he shared with thousands of species. The U.S. built border wall, uh, the U.S. built border wall, threatens the flow of all life. Macho B was caged, trapped in a snare so a radio collar could be wrapped around his neck. He died as a result on March 2nd, 2009, one of the last free-roaming Jaguars in America, North America. Here's one we talked about with students the other day um, because we had ICE agents come to our campus and um, as academic administrators we have a protocol that we have to follow if an ICE agent comes to campus and sometimes ICE agents are coming to campus for educational purposes to talk to students about getting study abroad visas and to um, talk about work permits but our students are understandably very sensitive and uh, so here's something that you know kind of resonates just very visually especially after the raids at the 7-elevens that were earlier this week so this is just a very very powerful piece and I'm happy to show it with you and I also purchased another portfolio for the library that deals with environmentalism and uh, I have that hung in the library and what's great is that I can just use those little 3M hooks little clips that go up and with the label information already available it's a really um, wonderful way to make very strong visual statements uh, with our students so that's migration now and through uh, as I told you, our students are very engaged with, with social activism and um, probably you all know, but I didn't know until all of this happened about uh, the detainment center in the Tide Flats of Tacoma. Are you, all of you aware that there's an immigration detainment center? Good morning. Uh, so one of our uh, students, uh, a leader in student government, her name is Amanda Diaz, and she is a Latina and very concerned about these issues. And so she started a, a really big movement on our campus for students to be engaged with the detainment center in Tacoma to see if they can help um, conditions. I was just talking to Jan about um, our prison system, which has a very limited resources for inmates. But in detainment centers, there are no programs, uh, there aren't any books, they're, they're run by private organizations, so it's, it's not a good situation. And our students uh, are very interested in zines, which I think are, 
part of the artist book movement. So they created this zine um, called Engage, and it's all about um, some of the issues associated with Tacoma's history, uh, migration, immigration, and treatment of underrepresented uh, groups, as well as essays and um, insights into um, the detainment center. And there's something that um, I um, think is worth just bringing up socially. Um, I don't know how many of you ever have ever heard of the Tacoma method. Is that something that rings a bell? It's not a very positive part of our um, history of Tacoma, but in 1885, and I'm just going to read a little bit here. <clears throat> On November 3rd, <clears throat> 1885, at 9.30 a.m., 500 white citizens of Tacoma <clears throat> Excuse me. Tacoma gathered and marched through Tacoma's Chinatown. They stopped at every Chinese residence and business and instructed the occupants to get on wagons and march down to a train headed to Portland, Oregon that day. This really, this happened. It was, the mob also visited homes and businesses of white citizens to intimidate the supporters of the Chinese community. So we you know, have to in, embrace that in our past, but also react to it and talk about it. And so all of these types of materials help students come to terms and to discuss those issues. Uh, a professor at PLU has written a small operetta um, on the Tacoma method. And we also have some of our local book artists that are interested in creating books that um, focus on that. Malpina Chan, who has a book uh, right here called Hand, is it hand? Hands, hands, up, hands Off, uh, is, co is considering you know, working on that because of her Chinese um, um, connection. But that's, I think, what... Do you, do you know what happened to the, uh, the people once they arrived in, in uh, Portland? In Portland? Um, no. I mean, I... I think they were accepted more in Portland, and as Portland today still has a vibrant China, Chinatown. Um, if you come to Tacoma and you go along Point Ruston, we do now have a Chinese um, rec reconciliation park, and the uh, the community has really been trying to embrace that past. But uh, one of the reasons I'm bringing this up is that I think we. You know, we sometimes hide parts of our history. We don't want to talk about them. And I really uh, respect the students and the faculty kind of digging down and taking, taking these issues into hand and thinking about them. So this is the zine that students created. And uh, I think that. In answer to her question, actually, some were shipped back to China. Were they? Yeah. Terrible, terrible. This happened throughout a lot of the Western cities, not just um, Tacoma, Tacoma. Seattle. So with that in mind, the book running down the center is a pretty big accordion book. And this book is not out of print, and I believe it was just purchased <laughs> <laughs> minutes ago. Um, and this book is called Detained. And this is a book that explores the immigrant detention centers in Washington state. And both sides tell a different story that follow two immigrants as they navigate through the Northwest Detention Center, which is the one in Tacoma, and the INS Center in Seattle. And it comes in a little wrapped um, box and then has two large posters to go with it. And uh, the artist is, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing her her name correctly, Erwin, Erwin Franklin, and she is known as a comics artist. So you can tell sort of this has that zine, zine feel. And this book was supported by the Artist Trust and the Office of Arts and Culture. So this is a grant-funded project, and it makes it very affordable. I think it was $16. So it's like every school should have this book. Um, and she tries to tell the story of just what it's like to be in these centers. So it's a, it's a pretty impactful book, and it, you can kind of have, have a look at it. as It takes a long time to digest and read, and 
So we have had this again with the posters and the book in the room and just have students in a classroom setting for an hour to be able to reflect and contemplate. So this is a book that um, I think is pretty impactful as well and I really appreciate it being affordable and also in a format that really appeals to students because they can resonate with the graphic type design. Many of our students are interested in graphic novels and as I said zines, so this makes the book very approachable. Is, is migration the new politically correct word for immigration? Uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I don't know if I can answer that. I mean, we, I've, you, I've heard the, the term migration used quite a bit in higher education. And in fact, I'm going to show you a book now that I just think is wonderful, and I think you'll all love it too. So, uh, is, is, are indigenous peoples included in this whole movement, and how badly they've been treated in this country as well, or is that a separate, separate issue? And in, I, I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, is is the the move to recognize the original inhabitants of the oh. United States kind of getting support and encouragement from the move to recognize all the people? Are you talking about like our uh, the Puyallup tribe and the Salish yeah, tribe well, and I, I, I right I mean, there's a whole culture here before. Absolutely. I mean, I don't have any books representing that, but I think you make a really good point that just highlighting underrepresented uh, groups is an important aspect of art at any point. And education, too. Sure. Because I didn't learn about any of this stuff when right. I was in the public school system. Yeah. Well, that's, that's interesting. You should raise this, and this is sort of a kind of deviating from artist books, but uh, about two months ago I hosted a meeting of art and architecture librarians from the Pacific Northwest which included a number of librarians from Canada and for those of you that have visited Collins Library you know that we have a small collection of totem poles in the front of the library and then two large standing totem poles in the library and the first thing they noticed was well you don't have any context you don't have in that wouldn't be allowed you wouldn't be allowed to display the totems like this in Canada which really made me start thinking about the way Canada that more right America. but so we've been working um, we've been working on that and we also have paintings of the American Western artist Abby Williams Hill some of you may be familiar with Abby Williams Hill she was a artist that worked in worked for the railroads and she painted landscapes of the Northwest and the national parks in the West to encourage people to move west. And she had a special relationship with the Flathead Indian Reservation and she lived there for many years and we have um, her paintings uh, that period on display in the library too. So it's really made me kind of stop and think about how we're telling the story. And we have a group of faculty, we're working on thinking of how our labels are, are portrayed and putting it in context. So um, I think it's something we all have to be aware of. And our local college has a huge um, indigenous component to it. And so this is a book, it's called Stories of Migration, and what I find so interesting about this, and this is available um, online from uh, Amazon, and the creator behind this is a professor, Ricardo Gomez, and he is a professor in the School of Library and Information Science, yay, at the University of Washington. And I thought it was so fascinating to find that as a professor of library and information science, he came to what he didn't realize were the book arts, so to speak, because he does a lot of work in how uh, communication narratives are shared, particularly with families affected by migration. So he does a lot of work in Mexico 
uh, with families whose members have migrated or crossed the border to work in the United States and how family stories, narratives, dialogues are shared because it's not always a simple matter of putting on your Facebook page or sharing a text on a cell phone. And so for many years he's been collecting stories of migration and he's also been doing work at the University of Washington. And I, is anyone here familiar with him? So he's been interviewing students at the University of Washington as well as faculty that have um, a cultural heritage associated with uh, Latina and Latinx um, populations and countries. And he created this flip book. And it reminds me, I think some of you have maybe seen the book I've, I believe I've shown before. It's called Mix and Match Families, where it's a flip book. So he's created this flip book that includes drawings of individuals as well as statements about um, the impact of migration. Mm -hmm. And of course you can make all different and new stories about this. So I'll pass that, uh, pass that down. And this is based on a project that he has well documented on his website called um, photo historias in which he's taking photographs and asking people to talk about their migration experience and he also has a wonderful program in which he asks people to bring in an object or artifact from their family and talk about the significance of that and document it. So this is a trade publication that is um, very much available. What's his name again? Ricardo Gomez. But he also um, worked uh, with a small village in Mexico in which he collected stories. And the women in the village were really the heart of the village and heart of communication. They were the storytellers and the keepers of knowledge. And he had an idea to take their stories and recreate his trade publication in a fabric book um, called Stories of Migration. And so um, this is a one of a kind. When I saw it, I was just so excited. And it was displayed in Tacoma with these prints at a small gallery called Spaceworks. And when I walked in, I said, I just have to have this book. And what's great is that all the money went back to the village and to the women who did this beautiful hand embroidery. So this is just a really special story and a special way of capturing, well, I'll pass it down this way. My book for the show is um, a story of my family and it includes photographs that my father took, the actual photographs and stitching into the book. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was just a really um, wonderful example of how to honor the traditional crafts and um, skills of the women in the village with the embroidery as well as to take that concept of migration and and show show that so I, I also have a little handout here that I'll leave that can tell and then my last um, book on the theme and I think some of you might be familiar with this book does this So I always, we always ask students, like, what is, does this kind of remind you of anything? Bible. Reminds you, yeah, it reminds you of a Bible. And um, it's, it's a very uh, beautiful book. I mean, you can keep kind of going. So do you mind reading that? It says... Um, blessed are the wetbacks. Mm. <laughs> blessed are the crop dusters. Do you mind if I keep asking no, interaction no, 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 here? Of course. Blessed are the house cleaners. Hmm. Blessed are the fence menders. See where this is going? To me, it's just, yeah. you know, a beautiful. This is amazing. Blessed are the day laborers. And maybe one more. Blessed are the dishwashers. So, 
you know, really this book is a uh, respectful tribute to all those individuals that often have to cross borders and are not represented well in our culture. And I'll just read you, this is by Philip Zimmerman, and this book was done in 2009. And I think the Migration por uh, Portfolio 2008. I mean, so of course, you know, now we're getting more attention to that. But he said, I had the germ of an idea for the book and did some preliminary sketches for it during my residency at Border Art Residency in New Mexico. I was taking a lot of photographs of the incredible skies in New Mexico and Arizona while there, and they made their way into a lot of work. Living right on the border, I was also very aware of the crossing of illegal Mexican immigrants, especially in the section of the Sonoran Desert. I was stopped for a couple of hours by several groups of uniformed men one day. Each group consisted of a large number of heavily armed Border Patrol agents on some sort of special operation. The agents eventually led out of desert scrub a large number of illegal immigrants who had been hiding in the mesquite and cactus as they attempted to head north through the park. They clearly were not drug smugglers. They looked poor and were unarmed, and it was a very moving experience. I had never seen an operation like this up close, and it was very, very upsetting, and got me thinking about life, the life these people were trying to make for themselves, and the efforts that we in the United States make to prevent them from coming here. This is the work that eventually came out of it. So, yes, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, and I think, um, Sanctus Sornaris. Yes, and I believe it's still available from um, Vamp and Trap. <laughs> so that's that. So um, I have one more book uh, kind of on the theme and also um, related to Bainbridge Island. So, of course, you probably all have worked or know um, Mary Jean Linford. Is that most just... So I had the pleasure of working with her at the barn this summer on a workshop with... Uh, middle school or you know, like thir 12 and 13 year olds. So that was interesting. She asked me to share social justice books with them and I'm, I, it was okay, but I think maybe next time I'd probably do zines or something with them, but uh, <laughs> it's a tough age. Um, but she was very kind to uh, give this book to me and maybe some of you are familiar with it, it Executive Order 9. 066. Have any, have some of you seen this book before? So are you all familiar with the executive order, um, which of course asked, uh, or not asked, demanded that our Japanese American um, leave uh, and become, and started the internment movement. And of course here on Bainbridge Island we have the wonderful Memorial Park uh, so what I particularly like about this book is that it's very, very approachable. And a lot of times with artist books, especially when you're working with students, uh, they can be a little intimidating and it can be a little scary to have this very complex structure in front of you and you don't know how to handle it and you're not quite sure what it's saying. But I find like the accordion fold book is something that really resonates with students and also in classes, we can actually make an, a little accordion book uh, pretty successfully. And what really appeals to me about this book is that Mary Jane has, Mary Jean, excuse me, has used personal narratives as well as family photographs and factual information associated with the history of the internment. And this book was done in the year 2000. And this is in Mary Jean's words. As history reminds us, the order was neither small nor simple. So of course, the format of the book is small and somewhat simple, but the order wasn't, was it? It was shocking. And I think at the University of Puget Sound, we, ha we own two of the posters that came out with the executive order 9066. But my archivist, who is new, always gets a little nervous when I come in and say, I'm taking all these books out and I'm taking it in a suitcase. So I decided I wouldn't take the poster for fear that it would. But 
have you seen the have any of you seen the posters i mean they're very big and you can imagine just getting up in the morning and these are plastered all over our um, world and i don't know if any of you have read the book the japanese lover yes um, there's a very thoughtful, I think, portrayal of um, internment in that book um, and what happened to uh, some uh, young lovers. And so it's a good book to read and gives you some good um, background information. So she tells the story of Kei Nako, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing, Nakao, sorry a Japanese-American citizen living on Bainbridge Island who was interred between the ages of 22 and 26. She shares a personal narrative and she uses photographs and she also, again, as a librarian, primary sources, um, the Seattle Times, the Bainbridge Review, to create a moving and personal story of this journey. So, um, I don't know, would you feel comfortable pulling a sure, photograph sure. out and you can kind of So there's the notice. We can pass this around one, and then. Yeah. Are you willing are, um, sure. to read I, that? I really need to get my glasses. Okay. Why, why don't you read it? Okay. Mm -hmm. We had seven days to get ready to go, to take care of everything, sell everything, give it away, or whatever. It was an order. My parents had lived in America for so long they were torn. My father had cashed in his life insurance to buy victory bond bonds for the war effort. Someone at the Seattle Post-Intelligencer came and took a picture of my mother looking at the war bonds. My brother, sisters, and I were all born, her, born here, so naturally we all felt we were American citizens. My parents did not want to go back to Japan. They were just American citizens without citizenship papers. So that's the beginning of the narrative, and she has a collection of photographs here. And then behind each photograph, she has uh, a bit of information. So this is about Executive Order 9066, the wording. So from an educator's point of view, what I particularly uh, like about this actual format is that it's approachable. It's something that we could mirror in a class in a short period of time in terms of the structure that it tells a personal narrative, so it validates a family's experience. So you could use this format in a class where you might be talking about any sort of personal relationships or family history. It uses photographs and then it's backed up with the facts. So I think this is a, a really beautiful book and um, she also uses washi paper, which is of course traditional um, handmade Japanese paper. So. Have any of you seen this book before? So, so I'm good. But we want to make sure that we get the the, the photograph back in. Is, is it passing around? Yeah, we can pass that around. So, any questions, comments, reaction to kind of this section of the books? Report to some place, or you know, something like that. That's not related to. I think we were just talking about Burma. that study the other day because we did a. This is study. Yeah, well, there was a study done. You could never get away with it now, but it was in the '60s. A teacher wanted to prove Ooh, a point, and so she, oh. for a couple, three weeks, I think she uh, was. She created prejudice against people with blue eyes. Oh, right. Yeah. That. And it was very successful. Yeah. Well, it, it's scary, scarily successful. Yes. Yeah. It'd be, this is, again, not related to artist books, but in the fall, we had a speaker named Sophia Noble, and she's an educator and librarian from the UCLA um, Information School. So I'm plugging all these librarians that are doing these really cool kind of communication <laughs> and global studies. But her area is algorithms of oppression. And she studies how our search engines, Google, Yahoo, um, Amazon, control and manage 
our information and results. And she started this work by um, a project in which she Googled black women and white women and looked at the results and the images that came up. Mm -hmm. And it's shocking. And then she's began an investigation in terms of how uh, Google creates al algorithms, mm -hmm. um, how they manage their searches. And it, it's really frightening, too. So I mean, as a librarian, we're really trying to help our younger generation understand the importance of critical evaluation and analyzing those results. And I see that I'm running out of time, so I'm going to be um, a little briefer with these books and then I'll let you look at everything. So um, just kind of looking at this, what do you see here? Yeah, white, a white container. So um, this book is brand new to the library, and it's called Unhooded, and it's by Ginger Burrell. You might have, you might have it. Or just, we don't right. have this. Right. So it examines the, and this is directly from the artist's statements, the alarming um, audacity demonstrated by white supremacists in the United States. Once hidden under homemade white robes, hence the symbolic nature. Um, today's alt-right members feel emboldened, empowered, and unafraid of the consequences of their racism. They no longer feel they have to hide their identity. Mm -hmm. This book looks at the direct and indirect messages from President Trump, so I have to tell you this is a political one, um, to white nationalists. And while he frequently claims ignorance of such a movement, his behavior and language tell another story. So I just felt it was super, super important to have this book in the library uh, for future generations of our students. Mm -hmm. And the way that it's using this kind of transparent cloth um, or paper to see through. And of course, it's filled with quotations. Pretty, pretty powerful. Wow. So it's, it's this vellum all the way through. Right. Oh my gosh. So there we have that. And I don't mean to give it the short trip by going through quickly, but um, I, I want to make sure we, we finish on time. And then um, before I show the student books, I have a very exciting book. Uh, so how many of you are familiar with Jessica Spring? Jessica Spring is a letterpress printer. She runs the Springtide Press in Tacoma. She also is director of the Book Arts Program at Pacific Lutheran University and runs the Elliott Press. And she brought this book to me um, in the fall and she said, I'm, it's a limited edition and I thought you might want to buy it for the library. So it's based on uh, Punch and Judy. Are any of you familiar with Punch and Judy? So. Anybody want to, like, what's Punch and Judy? Marion. Yeah, well, somebody wasn't very nice, right? Well, she created a book called Trump and Judy. So again, you know where my political is. Uh, so it's called a Dissolving Comedic Farce in Four Short-Sighted Acts. Short-Sighted. <laughs> Uh, I don't know, maybe we could share, like, reading this. We'll pass it around, so I'll read the first one. A pompous man rode into town, bloated orange and such a clown. <laughs> Given his throne by the electoral college, lacking voters and factual knowledge. Oh. His campaign revealed the real Mr. Trump. Such vitriol and women he continues to dump. And then we have a. <laughs> careful. Sorry. Could you show that again? Oh. Yeah. What happens when you pull yes, it down? What does it say when the you pull it down? Oh, the what does he said? Um, grab them by the pussy. You can do anything. <laughs> and I've never said that before. <laughs> As each woman he marries continues to age, Trump soon finds another babe to engage. One daughter, Ivanka, his pride and joy, 
Is Daddy's grabby attention cause to annoy? Brought to the White House, ask for advice. Her hubby helps too. Isn't that nice? <laughs> Should be banned from libraries, don't you think? Oh, libraries. Trump, oh, she, <laughs> Trump describing Ivanka in 2003. She's six feet tall. She's got the best body. Ha! That's so <laughs> inappropriate. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sorry, can you show us the image? Sure. Maybe I'll read the next one just to get this. As each woman he marries, oh, we've done that one. Trump hammers on women, minorities too, only rich white man's causes does he give due. Beating down health care, the LGBTQ. This Don is a terror, it's all he can do. Tweeting fake news, telling us lies, people he hires barely say they good, their goodbyes. There has to be some form of punishment. And this was to Trump's quote on women seeking abortions. And then the final page, push us too far and this story ends with women who have a message to send. Your slapstick is over, not funny at all. It's completely ridiculous, utterly small. Like Punch and Judy's a current curtains close, Trump has to bow, it's high time he goes. And then this says, such a nasty woman. <laughs> so I just felt it was appropriate to bring this today because it's the anniversary of the Women's March. So I'll pass that around. Um, and then to conclude, what I just want to talk to you about real quickly, and these are not associated with migration or social justice, but really interesting. Uh, we have Art 101, which is a class students take uh, as a requirement to fulfill an arts component. So in Art 101, these are generally not students that are artists. You know, they're taking that art class and they don't think they can do art and they've never been creative. So we have a project um, to make a tunnel book, which I felt, I said to the professor, that's kind of complex structure to start out with. And the students are supposed to um, visualize their lives and the idea is that they are talking, thinking about their life stories. And the Tunnel Book Project is asking them to illuminate a journey of their choosing um, in a tunnel book format. And that could be an imagined space, a personal experience, their hopes and dreams. And they created a series of books. And I thought it might just be interesting to show you, because um, I was really proud of the students, um, that they really thought about how to take a personal journey and document it. Um, and I've been buying these books for the collection because I think it's important for students to be able to see student work next to books such as these to encourage them in their artistic expression. So this is a student who uh, took a photograph and she recreated it in a tunnel book. And this tells the story of her um, journey um, through the south of France. So we, you know, we thought it was just fantastic. And she used maps and uh, recreated that perspective. So I'll pass that around. And she did a good job um, of getting a closure and a flat closure. Uh, this is another um, example, and this, this book I'm particularly fond of because this was done by um, a Japanese-American student who grew up in a family that, ne she said her family never talked about their Japanese-American heritage, never referred to any of their ancestors, never talked about Japan. And she met um, a young man, became romantically involved, and his family um, were Japanese speakers, had family in Japan, and she began to recognize that she, she wanted to learn more about her family and her heritage. So she went on a personal journey of starting to record that, those stories with her parents and find out why. And she made this book, and we just love it because 
what she did is she took a, a photograph. So she must have had some connection when she was young because she's dressed here. But she used this paper as a mirror. So her thought was that she's reflecting herself. And then she uh, just made this, we think, very visually lovely book about aspects of her family culture and mm -hmm. her boyfriend that she learned about. So I'll pass it this way. And then to conclude, uh, just to let you know, we've also been working with our graduate students in the School of Education. And it's really important for our educators as they go into the K through 12 environment to be able to respond and talk with students. And what we find is you might be a science teacher, but if there's a social issue or something that affects our society, students are going to come into the, social, the science classroom and ask and want to talk about issues. And Amy Ryken, who's our director and dean of education, is really terrific. And she has done a book called Am I a Boy or a Girl? Uh, that she self-published on, I think, Lulu or Blurb that uh, addresses gender issues. And her partner, Holly Send, is an altered book artist. So she's very interested in the book arts and has been super um, supportive of us. And she created a um, project uh, called Exploring Cultural Competency and Social Justice Through Artist Books. So with the graduate students, we had a session similar to, to this session. And last time, I shared with you some of the questions that we asked students to respond when we were looking at the books, like what issues of identity are being explored? How are you developing cultural competency by looking at these books? How is text engaged to powerfully um, relate to the reader? What message is the creator trying to get across? How does this book make you feel about the pro topic? So students look at the books, they engage in conversations, and then we have all come back as a group and students talk about, well, I never really thought of the issue of migration like this, or I never really thought of that side of the story. And as a result, students have to find, do a final project. And Amy gives them the opportunity to represent their project in any way they want. And four of the graduate students chose books. So um, this one I just really love. It was uh, published or made at our print and photo print and copy services at the university. So it's very approachable, students can use it. And it's called Lipstick on a Pig. So it's a really, really moving story about uh, a young man whose family has been involved in real estate in Tacoma for years, and they rent properties. And he grew up. And he said, I never thought about it. My parents wouldn't rent properties to certain people. And so what this book takes you on a journey of how he's come to recognize um, some of the inherent prejudices in his family and also to, whoops, timing, um, <laughs> also to recognize that he was holding those same thoughts because he had never just he had never really thought about it. So both Amy and I were just thrilled with this book because we really felt that as a result of looking at the artist books and engaging in that dialogue, he came to a new way of thinking about his role and how he was going to approach his family's business. And then to conclude with, this is um, a book called What Should I Wear? I think of Catherine Alice Michael, who, does, who did um, paper doll books, too. Um, a Choose Your Own Outfit of Adventure. And this is a book about a woman who uh, was in music education and was a conductor, and how she felt very volatile and judged when she's conducting and the type of clothing that she was expected to wear and how she was supposed to look. And so she created this uh, book about that experience and how she felt. Uh, so again, I just, I was, you know, super proud of these students and it was really wonderful. And at the end of the course, there was a little uh, 
uh, guess uh, gathering or exhibition. But I thought that these were just two really great examples of how the idea of making a book can translate in a fairly um, impactful way. So uh, I'm right on time. And I would just like to conclude by um, saying thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed this. And certainly, we can stick around to look at a few more things. And that husband's just going to have to wait, right? <laughs> so thank you all. Mm -hmm.